Hi, I'm Joan Raymond, and this is A Heart for Writing. And today I have a real treat. I am interviewing um, crime thriller writer, Douglas Skelton. Douglas was born in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, he's, a lit he's written 11 true crime and Scottish criminal history books, but now concentrates on fiction. A Rattle of Bones in Thunder Bay, the first Rebecca Conley thrillers were long listed for the Scottish crime book of the year as was his novel, Open Wounds. He's now at work on the next Rebecca Connolly thriller and lives in Southwest Scotland. Let's bring on um, Douglas. Hi, Douglas, how are you? Hi there, I'm fine, how are you? That's good. Yeah, we have like a, a an eight hour difference in time zones here. So. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it was, it's, early, it's early evening for me, but much later for you. Yeah. Oh, no, it's, much it's, earlier for you. Yeah, it's, it's morning for me. That's so. Right. It's, yeah. So um, this is really cool because this um, is going to come out on November 1st, which is the exact day that your book, um, A Rattle of Bones, is going to come out in the U.S. So yeah. we're going to talk about that in here in a little bit. But first, I want to get a little bit of background and talk about you. So um, let me. I like to ask this question for all the writers. When did you discover you had a heart for writing? Oh, uh, <clears throat> one of my earliest memories is is sitting on the floor uh, of the of our flat, our apartment in uh, Springburn in Glasgow, and I would be about maybe seven, writing a crime story called "Who Killed Cock Robin." <laughs> Very original, uh, and the, the storyline was Cock Robin was a TV uh, personality, and he died. He was murdered on camera, and a detective came and investigated. Mm -hmm. Many years later, I discovered that Ed McBain had written a book called 80 Million Eyes, in which a TV personality dies on camera. And the, the boys from the 87th Precinct came along and investigated it. And I swear he must have stolen my story. <laughs> he must have gone through the garbage uh, behind our, our flats and <laughs> taken my story. Um and improved upon it, I've got to say. But I was only seven. I can't even remember what the solution is, but I, I have this memory of, of sitting on the floor uh, in this tenement flat in Glasgow. So, writing this story. so at seven, you were um, aware of all these things going on because you must, must have watched television or, or yes. whatever. Yes, I'll have been very influenced by by TV at that stage. And I'm surprised it wasn't a Western because I would watch a lot of Westerns as a boy. So Cheyenne and uh, Maverick and Bonanza were, were, were my favourites. Uh, but no, I seemed to decide that then for some reason I would write a crime story. Instead of a Western crime. Instead of a Western, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Still want to write a Western. Or maybe, maybe I will one day. Oh, I think you should. That would be really yeah. awesome. yeah. Because uh, one of your books, uh, which we'll talk about, uh, one of them is actually set in New York. Most of them are set uh, mm. where you live, but you do have one that's set in the States, too. Yes, so. yes, you, yes. Well, you could have it in the Old West. You never know. You know? Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so your past jobs. I love this. I'm going to read this. You've been a bank clerk, a tax officer, a taxi driver for two days. Hey, that's good. Uh, a wine waiter for two hours. That's even, that's awesome. A journalist and an investigator of real life crime for the Glasgow, Glasgow um, solicitors. So how did all of these jobs from the past influence uh, your writing? Um, well, not them all, obviously. The, 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 the wine waiter certainly didn't influence anything at all. <laughs> I wasn't there long enough. Um, even the taxi driver, uh, wouldn't but um the the journalism obviously brought me into the writing in the first place um and the doing the work for the glasgow solicitors really did influence um a lot of what i'd done before i'd already had books published before i started working for them i'd i'd, I'd started writing non-fiction uh, and basically true crime. Mm -hmm. And that came through the journalistic work that I'd done. I, I wrote some uh, features for an evening newspaper in Glasgow called The Evening Times, and they used them in their Saturday editions, and they were, were looking at old crimes in the city. And that led to my first book, which was uh, Blood on the Thistle, which was a compendium of 20th century murder cases. That then 
led to the second book, which was uh, an investigative piece into a miscarriage of justice um, here in Scotland, and so on and so forth. And, and eventually I, I moved into, into fiction. Um, by the time I was moving into fiction, I was doing some investigative work for these solicitors. They, they call it, or they used to call it, precognition work because under the Scottish legal system at the time, there was no discovery process to speak of. So the most that the defence would get is a list of witnesses that the prosecution may call if they felt like it at the time. They wouldn't get the statements that they'd made. They'd no idea what these these particular uh, witnesses might say. So the solicitors would send somebody like me out to interview these wow. people. But... The, the, the particularly one of the solicitors that I worked for would really go into the cases. So there was also investigative work. So I would also be trying to find witnesses and banging on doors and looking for CCTV footage, mm -hmm. uh, interviewing, you know, various people to try and, and, and help them with their case. So that was, that was very much a, a learning curve for me and a lot of what I learned there fed into the first fictional series that I did which was the four David McCall books that started with Blood City. Mm -hmm. Wow so you were actually in the thick of it you were talking to witnesses you were talking to I mean you were doing what detectives do basically yeah. here yeah you know? yeah yeah, so yeah, certainly doing that, and um, it's a you, lot of... you were you were the uh, amateur sleuth almost, you know. That's that. right. I, I was out there. I, I was the tarnished knight out there walking the mean streets of of the city of Glasgow. <laughs> yeah. um, it, a lot of it's, it's a lot of ex police officers do that kind of work once they take their yeah. their retirement. They 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 would have done that kind of work. Um, but the, the the solicitors that I worked for preferred not to use former police officers. They liked right. to use somebody like me, although they did use former police officers as well. But I, I mean, I got a lot of work and I made a living at it uh, and did it, did it for a few years. But it was really, really, it really did teach me a lot uh, about the city and about crime and about the people that commit crimes and the victims right. of crimes. Um, and, and it was an eye opener in a lot of ways I because I was, I was going into the, you know, a lot of the tougher areas of, of Glasgow. Mm -hmm. uh, and investigating petty crime and major crime like like bank robbery and and murder I'm afraid so would people talk to you more because you were not the police I mean because you were just a regular person and asking questions uh, no because a lot of them just would wouldn't speak to me at all they had been told by the authorities that they didn't need to speak to somebody like me which is true they, mm -hmm. there was you know they, they had no I had no power and I had no warrant. I had no way of forcing people to talk right. to me. Uh, and so they would say, I ah, well, the police, the police told me that uh, I don't need to speak to you. And I said, well, that is perfectly true. You don't need to speak to me. But did yeah. they tell you the rest? And then they would say, no. And so, <laughs> well, the rest is that I will go back and report to the solicitor who has hired me to do this and tell them that, that you don't want to speak to me. Now, if he feels that what you might have to say is important to his case, he can cite you to appear in court and be precognosed, in other words, be interviewed right. under oath in front, <laughs> in front of a sheriff. Oh, and uh, I'm sure they just like, woo, let's just talk now. And they would yeah. say, oh, no, they didn't say that. And I said, well, that can happen. I've got to tell you that. I said, yeah. but you do not need to speak to me but anything you do say to me, it's not under oath. So that was the other thing. They could tell me anything that they wanted, huh. and I would duly note it down, uh, type it up as a statement, give it to the solicitor, and then they could go into court and say something completely different, uh. and there was no comeback whatsoever. Wow. So that was the system at the time. They've since they've since brought in, a, you know, what you in the states call the discovery. So there's a bit right. more discovery, and statements are provided to the defence. Yeah, what a what a frustration for the solicitors. I mean, you know, because they might think they have a really good witness, and all of a sudden they're just like, "Whoop! I didn't say anything." So yeah, yeah, as as happened a few times that that they had a witness, and then they went in and said something completely different. So. Yeah, well, I think that happens here too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, yeah. people. Um, so um, in your books, you deal, there's police procedure, obviously, there's some police procedure. And mm -hmm. since you are not 
an ex cop or detective, but you do have that background. How do you um, how do you deal with the police procedure? Do you have a go to person? Do you have someone that reads your books? <clears throat> I don't have somebody who reads them. I, I I don't have a lot of police procedure in the books because I the the, the police characters are very much um, supporting characters. Yeah. They will come in and they'll come out. Uh, the, the the main investigative work in my books, certainly in the, the in the Rebecca Connolly books, is Rebecca, and she she's a journalist. So that that I do know. I am also taking liberties with with a lot of things. So. Um, if 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 an element of police procedure doesn't suit me, uh, I'll just ignore it uh, <laughs> because I can get away with that because it, she's not a police officer. Right. Um, so, for instance, we we have a system uh, in Police Scotland because uh, we have a national police force in Scotland um, where if there's a major incident, then a major incident team will be assigned to it, um, and a murder is a major incident. I've just ignored that totally um mm -hmm. and just had my team police officer if you want to call her that uh, as part of a major incident team so she can deal with anything that happens um we can do that in fiction it's it's all about suspension of of of, of belief. disbelief or, right, or yeah. suspension of belief right. um uh, and as long as it makes sense, I think you you can get away with it. There are certain things you can't get away with, you know, because Scots law is different from UK law, the, the English law. Um, it's it's a separate entity and it has its own routines. So, for instance, I couldn't have a jury uh, of 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 twelve people because in Scots law it's fifteen. Wow. Okay. Um, so th that sort of thing. Th there is also, we have the corroboration rule where every bit of evidence has to be corroborated by a separate piece of evidence. Now that's open to a lot of abuse and indeed it is, but it's still there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we have various other bits and pieces. Uh, I, I couldn't call if there was any sort of uh, deliberate fire set in any of my stories. I, I couldn't call it arson because we don't have a crime of arson. We have willful fire raising. Really? Yeah. Will, okay, wait a minute. Willful, willful fire? Willful fire. fire raising, yes. That's interesting. We don't have burglary. Okay. We have a theft by housebreaking or opening lockfast place or theft by OLP. Wow. Um, so that sort of thing is, is what you've got to watch for. We don't have a coroner. Now, the okay. coroners in, in England aren't like your coroners in the States. The coroners in England are very much, they'll just rubber stamp people and uh -huh. they'll have a, an inquest. We don't have inquests in Scotland. In fact, I was saying that, to, telling somebody that just today. Um, we don't have inquests in Scotland. They have them in England, but we don't. Uh, so everything would be uh, investigated by the police and then the procurator fiscal, which is kind of like the district attorney. Okay. Um, but just kind of like the district account, we don't vote for them. Uh, so uh, the procurator fiscal is is the prosecutor essentially. So who so, does a who does an autopsy then? We have um, we we have pathologists okay. who do the autopsy, uh, which we don't we don't call them autopsies either. They are post mortems. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Although that the autopsy is creeping in. Uh, here I've noticed uh, uh -huh. more and more, but it's uh, I still call it a post mortem or a PM. Uh -huh. um, we also have a, a, a habit in in British uh, uh, crime fiction that people, when they talk to the police, they will call them detective. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's something that the author has picked up from the US. Yeah. Uh, I have never, and I've spoken to police officers, and they said, "No, I've never been called detective." Uh, so, when, you know, if you were being interviewed by it, to, you, you would say, right. "Well, detective, this is what happened." So, we've been getting that, and it's not. I think it might well be creeping in now, thanks to TV, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's never been something that was that was called here. It would be detective constable, detective sergeant, or Mister or Ms or whatever they, they want to be called. Yeah, I've heard constable a lot. You know, I've heard Con that, yeah. constable. You'll get that if they're if if they're uh, if they're in uniform. Mm -hmm. It'll be constable. And if they're not in uniform, 
Captain. It'll be Detective Constable, Detective Sergeant. Or okay, so just... you still have the word detective, but you would you add something yeah. to it. Okay. Yeah, or, or just DC, you know, DC Smith or DS Smith or whatever. But yeah. I have never heard anybody, you know, in real life call a police, you know, when they're addressing a, uh, a plainclothes de- officer calling the detective. Huh. That's yeah, and, and you got to be careful about that. Yes, because mm-hmm. with American readers reading that, they're going to notice. I mean, they'll think about it. But if your your readers are reading it, they're going to pick it up right away. Uh, you know? it, it sticks out like a sore thumb yeah. to me. Whenever yeah. I see it, I just go, whoa, whoa. Yeah. But as I say, it probably is creeping into real life now, thanks to TV. People will be calling uh, plain clothes. They will be saying detective this and detective mm-hmm. that. And there's also, um, I don't want to get, political this is not really political but i i know that uh, there's a lot of um writers who want to make sure that people on both sides you know the british and the americans when they read it they understand what they're reading so they yeah. kind of take liberties which uh, personally if i'm going to read a, a british you know thriller or, or mm-hmm. cozy mystery or something i want to see what it is over there i i want to I want to read it in there with their vernacular. You know, I yeah. don't want it to become Americanized or anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Coming from Glasgow, I, I, I'm well used to the Americanization because Glasgow is known as the, the 51st state. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, there is a strong link between Glasgow and the states. There is an affinity mm-hmm. there. Uh, our city streets, for instance, are, are created in a grid. Very wow. Much like, very much like New York. Wow. Um, and in fact, the movie makers have discovered that they can come to Glasgow and it will double for Boston and Philadelphia and New York uh, quite often. I mean, quite often now our, our streets are blocked because Hollywood is there uh, wow. and turning turning out, you know, the streets into, into some American uh, city. Right. Um, the, the 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 new Indiana Jones was here just last year, and oh. uh, Batman the the Batman was bits of the Batman was filmed here. Batgirl, which uh, Warner right. Brothers have shelved for some reason, uh, was was filmed here quite con- you know for quite a while last wow. year. And it's just because the the architecture fits the the the, the grid like streets fit, um, and the opening to uh, the the zombie movie World War, I would say Z, you'll say Z probably right. with with Brad Pitt, that that the opening to that was Glasgow, um, and it's our George Square that you see. There's an aerial shot, and the zombies are flooding across it, and uh, it, that that was Glasgow as well. So we had Brad Pitt over here <laughs> filming that. Interesting. Yeah. So um, you were talking about. Um, Writing true crime. You wrote mm. true crime from. Uh, they were published from 1992 to 2009, um, which eventually led to 11 novels. Tell us why you wrote those true crime novels. It was what I drifted into because I'd been doing journalism and I was working in a, a weekly newspaper in the in the West End of Glasgow. And by default, I became the the, the crime reporter, which meant okay. I went round to various police stations in our area and took the crime reports uh, that, that they gave me, and you know we, we published them as as stories. Okay. And from there, I started writing features for the Evening Times, as I mentioned, on criminal history. And the features editor of the Times at, at that point said to me, he said, "You know, I think you've got a book." in this and he put me in touch with an edinburgh publisher mainstream publishing mm-hmm. which was subsequently bought by harper collins and um they they i put forward the idea and they accepted it within a matter of days uh i was very very lucky i just hit the right person at the right time when they were looking for that sort of thing and then publishing luck plays an incredible uh role if you just have the right thing hitting the right yeah. desk. At the I right mean, is everything. Yeah. Um, so that started me on that. And it, then it led to the, the investigative piece for the miscarriage of justice. And the publisher would contact me and say, well, what have you got coming next? Uh, so I was very, very lucky in that regard. And that they came to me and said, what's coming wow. next? I don't think it was because I sold a a tremendous deal. I think maybe I was some sort of tax write-off for them. Um, (laughs) 
and uh, I just couldn't understand this. Uh, but I kept coming up with ideas, and I wrote, you know, the true crime stuff. But eventually, I, I after I think four or five, I thought I don't really want to do, you know, a modern true crime anymore. It just didn't mm -hmm. sit well with me. I was turning real life tragedy into entertainment. Yeah. Um, the the investigative piece aside, that was a serious book. Um, so I started to go back in history and started to do more historical crimes and 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 uh, things that were connected to you know the Scottish legal system um and one of them was the, the history of the Edinburgh toll booth uh, which was the town jail up until 1820 and I, I couldn't believe that nobody had ever actually done this because hmm. there's a tremendous amount of stories connected to this building that's no longer there um, it would. It, it sat next to. If, if anybody knows Edinburgh, um, it sat next to St Giles Cathedral uh, in the High Street, and uh, an incredible amount of stories, and so important to to Scottish history because it was a building that had such a vital role to play, not just as a jail, but it was also Parliament for a while, and it was a courtroom, and it was an execution site, oh. and it was the council. Uh, buildings for, for Edinburgh and Mary Queen of Scots was there James the first uh, and sixth were there all you know a lot of the kings and queens had 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 uh, had, had visited there and actually held court there uh, and a lot of history took place in and around this building so I, I wrote that book and uh, that led to one called Indian Peter uh, which was a true story about a man called Peter Williamson who was taken from uh, the docks in Aberdeen and transported to the American colonies, as they were then, and wow. sold into indentured servitude. And he was, wow. only four, he was only 14. And he had all sorts of adventures before eventually, and he, he was captured by Native Americans. He escaped from them. Um, he joined the militia to fight in the French and Indian Wars, um, he was captured at Oswego in, in uh, New York State. He was exchanged as a prisoner of war, brought back to uh, Britain, dumped on the South Coast, and he walked from the South Coast back to Aberdeen telling his story to pay wow. the way. He got to York where he fell in with some businessmen and they, they published his adventures for him, which he then sold in his travels to, to, to pay the way. He got to Aberdeen. He was calling out the local businessmen and council people and uh, nobility because they were behind this, this, this trade where they took people off the streets or tricked people into signing their indentures away for seven years and they'd be transported to, to work on the plantations. Uh, he was arrested. His book was burnt in the street by the public hangman. He was he was chased out of town, effectively. He ended up in Edinburgh, where he began a 20-year legal battle wow. uh, with these, these very powerful men. All sorts of jiggery-pokery, as we call it, going on during those 20 years on both sides. Dirt, you know, dirty tricks were being pulled. Right. In the meantime, he became a publican. He became a publisher. He became an author. He wow. developed, he, he published the first street directory of Edinburgh. He brought in the first penny post in Edinburgh. Eventually, he won his case against wow. the, the these men in Aberdeen. Um, he went through a very well publicized divorce. It was very well publicized because he was the man who publicized it. <laughs> and uh, he, he, he got a pension when he sold the, the penny post to the, the fledgling GPO, General Post Office, mm -hmm. Royal Mail, effectively. And uh, he died uh, almost penniless wow. and probably an alcoholic. Um, so it was an incredible story that I, I just stumbled over. And so that was a book that I'm particularly proud of. Wow, that's amazing. And so then, so in thir 2013, you started to concentrate on fiction. Yeah. And so, you know, you kind of said why you went from nonfiction to fiction. You wanted to just go a different way. Mm -hmm. So I wanted, let's talk about, um, these, are the, these are the books. And these are the ones that, um, the, the Scottish Crime Book of the Year. So explain mm -hmm. that. 
Yeah, well, this this is the this one of the series that I'm working on at the moment, and it began with Thunder Bay. It's out of order. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this graphic. is the picture they showed on Amazon. I know, I know, yeah. I, I know, uh, but it is out of order. Um, so it began with Thunder Bay, and it's it's um, basically what I do is I, I I use something from Scottish history. Mm-hmm. Uh, or mythology as a springboard for a modern day crime story. Um, so Thunder Bay, there's a lot of mythology uh, based on around this this Hebridean island which I invented. Okay. But on top of it, there is a there is a crime story that my protagonist Rebecca Connolly, who's a young reporter in the Highlands of Scotland, uh, she's she's following it up. Uh, it was followed by The Blood Is Still, which mm-hmm. used uh, the Battle of Culloden. Which was just it took place just outside, just outside Inverness in 1746. It was the end of the of Bonnie Prince Charlie's campaign to try and regain his throne. Um, so it uses that as a springboard, and then the third one was a rattle of bones, which is the one that's coming out in the states uh, in uh, t- today, November the first. Right, um, and it uses as a springboard. Uh, the a miscarriage of justice from the 18th century and actually starts in 1752 on a small hill above a place called Balakulish, which is which is in the highlands and the the remains of a man who's been hanging there for two years James Stewart James of the Glens are about to be taken down and that's the springboard into the modern day when another James Stewart has been uh, is is in prison for a crime that he he claims he didn't commit. Yeah. Um, so there's mirrors there on the the uh, offence in 1752 in the sorry 18th century because James Stewart almost certainly was not guilty of the murder that he was convicted of. And so Rebecca uses you know is aware of that and. Um, investigates the the modern day uh, murder and tries to to expose that so that's what a rattle of bones is is about and And the fourth one i was going to show this this is actually the the, that's the uk that's the uk cover the the us cover is is different from that yes and that one is already out where you are but this is the one coming out today yeah yeah so and, that, that came out last year over here in the UK. And then and this is the one, the last one, but we yeah, don't have it yet. You don't have it yet. That just came out in the UK earlier this year. And uh, that uses as a springboard um, uh, an occult case that's based on on a real case on the island, island of Iona uh, in the 1920s. And I was going to show this too. I mean, you've got um, drenched in mystery, Highland history, and dark humor it drips with tension. You've got some really good reviews. I, I want uh-huh. to read this here. The Publishers Weekly hmm. said once again, Skelton carefully draws together the many plot strands in this rewarding slow burner, rich in both characters and landscapes. Skelton remains a writer to watch. And you've got a starred review. Yeah. That's- that's very, you know. Congratulations on that. Yeah, no, it's, it's very kind of them. The Publishers Weekly have been uh, have been very kind about the entire series so far. So, and I'm 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 grateful for that. I'm glad that they, that they like them. And so, um, your books mentioned taking a more lyrical, slightly gentler tone with Rebecca Connolly. She's a reporter, so mm-hmm. obviously her job it allows her access that the police don't have. Is that why you chose a reporter? <laughs> Yes. When I started writing fiction, I thought long and hard as to, to what I was going to do. And I, the one thing, I, 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 one of the many things I didn't want to do was I, I didn't want to do a police procedural because you had uh, Ian Rankin, Val McDermott, Alex Gray, Lynn Anderson, all you know doing that, that sort of thing. And, and there was nothing that I could add to it. So my first series of novels was the, the, the Davy McCall books which started with Blood City. Uh, there was four of them and they were taken from the point of view of the criminals. So Davy McCall is a criminal. He's mm-hmm. he's what we call a hard man in, in Glasgow. But he wants out. He doesn't like what he does, but he's very, very good at what he does. Um, and uh, so so that was the, 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 the approach I took with them. Once I'd done the four, there the, the, the was always only going to be four of them. 
uh, and anybody who who might have read them will understand why because if they've read the last one um but from there i i lightened things up i did two books uh, featuring a character called dominic quest with with an e at the end and i had a number of rules when i started writing one was um that i would never uh, have a character with a strange name so i came up with dominic quest <laughs> uh two was that i wouldn't write a serial killer book um the second Dominic Quest is a serial killer book. And the third rule was <laughs> that rules one and two don't necessarily apply. So I was all right there. Uh, but <laughs> Just as long as you make up your own rules. Yes, yes. Good, right? So the, the, the Dominic Quest books um, were really, I, I, because the Davy McCall books were, were based very much in reality, everything that I'd learned in the investigation work that I had done, sort of poured into the Davy McCall books. Uh, and yes, there's humour in them, but they're, they are quite dark, they're quite stark, uh, and they're very, the, 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 you know, they're rooted in reality. With the Dominic Quest books, I wanted to just go, oh, right, that's it, and take a deep breath and just dive in. And so if I wanted to have a shootout in the middle of a, a public park in the east end of Glasgow, which is something I wouldn't have done in the, Demi, in the Davy McCall books, I would do them in the Dominic Quest books. And the approach I took with them is the the rule that, or not rule, but the, the suggestion that Raymond Chandler came up with is that if you feel your story is slowing down, have two guys with guns kick in the door. <laughs> so that was it with Dominic Quest. So the first one was the Dead Don't Boogie, it was called. And I just started writing. I don't plan I just yeah. start you're to write. You're a, you're a pantser like oh, I am. Very, just... very much. Or a, or a freewheeler, uh, yeah. I, I've, I've heard it called, which yep. is, is, is easier to Discovery say. Discovery than... writer is another you, one. Yo, that's, that's a bit too fancy. I, I know. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I, I just started writing with Dominic Quest, and I got to about 55,000 words, and I thought, I'm, I hadn't thought of a plot. <laughs> I just kept throwing things in and actually did have guys kick the door in with guns in their hand. That's and I had to stop writing and say, I need to work out why all this is happening. So it took me a couple of days. I came up with a plot line. Um, and then I, that got to the end of the first draft and then I could retrofit what I'd, what I'd written before to, to what I'd come up with. Um, so that was the idea. After that, I... I thought, well, what can I, I, I like to challenge myself when, when I'm starting something new. So what can I, what, can I write something that's not set in Glasgow or Scotland and doesn't have any Scottish characters whatsoever? Wow. So that's why I did the Janus run, which is the one that you mentioned that's set in New York. Mm -hmm. And my aim with that was to, to write, um, apart from Westerns, I have a great love for 70s uh, movie thrillers. Uh, and conspiracy thrillers. So could I write something that is in that style, but set in the present day and set in New York? And that was the whole notion behind the Janus run. So there was a lot of movie stuff in there, uh, not overt, but I was very much aware of it. I was trying to write a 1970s action thriller huh. um, and, and just put it on the page. Uh, whether or not I pulled it off is up to the reader to, so to decide. So a question, have you ever been to New York? I have, yes. Oh, okay, okay. Yep. Uh, I, 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 I heart New York, as, as they say. <laughs> I, I, I do love New York. And, of course, as I said, we're, we're steeped in it here, you know, between movies, TV, right. and this affinity that Glaswegians have for, for cities like New York. Mm -hmm. um, so, as I say, but probably New Yorkers would read it and say, no. That's not written by New York. And, and I'm sure they will, just as I do when somebody who's not from Glasgow writes about Glasgow. And I, no. Yeah. No. Uh, and they just some, missed it. They just missed yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Some celebrated books as well that, that you know, much hyped and, and much lauded. And I've read them and said, no. Nope. <laughs> it's, it's not Glasgow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Rebecca but, Connolly. So how was she? Then, born? Came, then came Rebecca. Again, it was this idea. Can I challenge myself? What can be the challenges? Can I write a, a, a book where the protagonist is a 20-something female? Female, yeah. Uh, because 
you, you know, the more eagle-eyed of your viewers will have noticed I am not 20-something and I am not female. Yep. So can I do this? Uh -huh. uh, and that was the challenge. And I, I, I do, I, I, I appear to have pulled it off. Nobody has, has come to me and said, no, um, she, she's not admiring herself in a mirror. Uh, you know, so she doesn't do anything like that. And um, so I, I, I think I've done it. And I've now written the the fifth one. That's what you were saying. Yeah, because we won't yeah. get that for quite a while. But no, you're, yeah. no. So the fifth one, which is not out here yet, it doesn't come out in the UK till till next June, I think it is. Wow. But it is written. Uh, so I think I, I, I think I must be, be pulling it off. And of course, she's developing over yeah. the book. She's changing. Your characters, ha I believe, have to have to grow. She's getting older. She's 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 becoming more experienced about things. In the first one, she's a bit naive about mm -hmm. life and and everything else. Um, she's she has had she's got issues because uh, she's had various problems. Although she's only in her mid twenties, uh, she's already uh, experienced sadness and experienced loss, and she's coping with that. And uh, that continued into the into the blood is still she was still coping with that. And then there was more added in to it and there, and then in a rattle of bones, which is the one that's coming out today. Um, things kind of come to a head for her uh, in her private life, but she 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 does manage to force all of this down so to concentrate on the professional. Right. But the and, beauty of it is, is because her past is going to affect how she reacts to things in the future, and writing so many books like this, you're able to bring in her backstory a little bit at a time. You don't yes. have to just put it all on the page like some you know, brand new readers are writers right. do. It's like, well, they want to tell you everything that happened to them. Well, over a series of books, you find yeah. out more and more and you get deeper. And that's, I love that. I just yeah. love that. Yeah. And, and she, she changes, as I say, yeah. in a rattle of bones. There has to is, be a character arc. This, yeah. yeah, this is a turning point for her. I, I can't say what it is, but no, there is a, yeah. there is, there's a turning point in each of the books. Um, but this is a big turning point because when you come to Where Demons Hide, which is the fourth one, she she is a almost a changed character. Right. Wow. Almost. That's almost. Awesome. <laughs> so, so everybody that reads Rattle of Bones is going to be like, oh, man, we're going to have to wait another whatever year before it comes <laughs> yes. out in the US, right? Thanks a lot. I guess we could always buy the ebook off the, the you know your website or something you know yeah your, but, don't, but, yeah. but don't tell don't tell skyhorse that no no no. <laughs> no 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 poor, poor skyhorse personally i love i love a print book i love to hold yes. the book in my hand you know I, I'm, one of, I, I'm an old-fashioned what can i say i, I don't know? even have a kindle or or an, an ebook Reader, I, I, I'm old fashioned as well. My house is filled with books. You can I see only a few. See. There's just a couple in the back. That's yeah. that's just a couple. There's more over here. There's more in the next room. There's more out there. There's more <laughs> upstairs. There's, you know, the, there's shelves there with where it's double packed. I've got books uh -huh. behind books oh, yeah. because I, I, I ran out of shelf space. So I just packed yeah. away um, generally, you know, other Scottish authors and hide them out the way. But uh, <laughs> So it's I, I, books, books and CDs. I, I can't seem to stop buying CDs either. I I, I prefer CDs to, to digital downloads too. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. So we're getting we're going kind of long on this, but this is just totally fascinating. That's, I want to. That's ask my you, fault. Sorry. No, it's okay. I want to ask you one question, and then I have two final questions. So, research rabbit holes. Oh my mm. gosh! I know mm. all of us struggle with this, but tell us about your research rabbit holes. Yeah, you do tend to go down rabbit holes and you have to be very focused. Um, I think, I, I like to think I am focused on the research now. There was a time when I would go away, but if I hadn't gone down a rabbit hole when I was researching Dark Heart about the toll booth, I might never have found Peter Williamson. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it brings results, it, it bears fruit. Uh, my thing about research is I only do what I need to for the fiction uh, because I'm, I'm currently writing an historical series, my first proper historical series and uh, I've just written the, the, the second one and what I did with that is I started writing and then researched as I went along. So I would write and say well I need to know about that and then I would research that. So that prevented me uh, from going down any rabbit holes with that. Mm -hmm. Um, 
it did bring some some uh, fruit because I you know I discovered one certain thing by accident that kind of changes the atmosphere of the book that I've used. Uh, for the Rebecca's, uh, there's there's not really a lot of research that's needed. I will because I'm not going in, in the historical thing. I'm not going into great detail about it because it's really just a springboard. So I'll do a bit of research, and some of it I've already done anyway. But most of it I've already done for for some of the other books. Um, but I'll do a bit of research just so that I can get a flavour of what the story is. So I would I read up about James of the Glens for the Rattle of Bones. I read a bit more. Uh, I visited the sites. I'd already visited the sites, his execution site, and where where uh, he's he's buried, um, where he was buried eventually. So I, I, I because I take Rebecca there. So that kind of research, you've got to go and, and as, right. as uh, somebody once said to me, you know, walk in the stones and, and touch the walls and touch the trees and things like that, uh, which Rebecca does. Uh, she's a habit of going to places and she'll touch. It's very tactile. She'll touch the stones and touch the trees um, because she feels that the past will speak to her uh, through that. Um, so... Research is something you've got to watch. It's very, very easy to be diverted. But sometimes when you're diverted, you find that nugget yep. that you can use. Yep, I agree with you. So the last two questions I have are advice for writers. The one is, what advice do you have for writers who want to write true crime? <sighs> it's... You, you have to, in my opinion, you have to be careful because you have to remember if you're doing modern stuff, modern material, then there are people still around. So you've got the families of victims, you've you've got the families of the accused. It depends what what the crime is. So I think you have to be very very careful where you go. I think there's a tendency, and I've been probably been guilty of it to um, sensationalize things, and that can be very very hurtful for people. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the reasons I stopped doing it. Um, so just please always remember that these are real people that, that you're writing about and dealing with and just tread lightly. Yeah, that's good. And then, of course, uh, advice for writers who want to write crime thrillers. Make just rules write. and break them, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the, there are no real rules. I know Elmer Leonard had his uh, 10 rules um, to, to, to writing crime, and that's fine as a, as a springboard, but rules are there to be broken. So write your story the way that you want it. You might need to change it because an agent might, you know, if you're trying to get an agent or a publisher, they, they will have uh, notes to give you if, if they accept it. But you have to, you have to please yourself first but always be prepared. You always have, don't be precious. Uh, you have to be prepared to look at somebody else's point of view. If you want to be published, you might need to compromise. When you are published, the big thing is don't let praise go to your head and don't let criticism get into your head. Uh, be prepared for both because people will say you're wonderful. Uh, they will also say you're the worst thing that's ever happened to crime <laughs> writing. Yep. Uh, and you have to, you can, yeah, as you know, you have to take that on the chin. Uh, there's a lot of ways out there for for people to criticise you, and you, you have to be ready for that as well. You have to take the one stars and the five stars, and just you do, not, yeah. you do, and and some of the one stars will be malicious, and some of the five stars will be people that just want that, that know you and just want to do you a good a good turn. So yeah. you have to be aware of that as well. So that's why I say don't let the, the, the praise get go to your head and don't let the criticism get into your head. Yeah, if I it's like constructive, that. listen to it. If it's not, just ignore it. Yeah, that's really good. I like that. I think that's I think that's for all writers. Yeah. We need to remember not to let it go to our head, but also not let the negative stop yeah. us. Because, yeah. you know, people are cruel. And sometimes... Hey, we can't please everybody, right? Our books you can't. Are... It's impossible. You're not going to please everybody. Right. You might have written the, the, what you think is the best book in the world, and somebody's going to come along and say, "Yeah, that's <laughs> that's fine." That's you know, everybody's yep. different. We all have different tastes. That's right. Um, Douglas, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you and meeting you. Um, I have absolutely loved this, and um, I I hope everybody watching um, got something out of it. And thank you. No, thank you. Thanks for having me.
thank you for watching. Um, and <clears throat> if you've seen something that you really enjoy, I'd appreciate it if you'd like and subscribe to my channel. Also, check out the um, the uh, the description. There's links to find how get a hold of Douglas. Um, find him online. I mean, you know, find his social media, find links to his books. And don't forget, today's the day his book comes out. So, you know, we want to make sure that we support him. Thank you again.